Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to learn how to age well and look and feel good for longer. And I know a lot of you, like me, are interested in the home anti-aging technologies that are around and are trying to work out which ones are best for you and how to get the most out of them. Well, one thing I've come to believe in the last few years, and I mentioned it in my video last week where I shared the evidence and my own experience on using microcurrent, is that in my own view, rather than going hard at our skin, we should be trying to work out what the minimum amount of use that leads to results looks like for us and our skin when it comes to both skincare actives and home devices. So we're not looking at the maximum our skin can possibly tolerate, but the minimum that delivers results for us in terms of lifting and plumping skin to secure our long-term skin health. The two types of device I use multiple times a week are microcurrent and red light, and I use them for just a few minutes at a time. And when it comes to microcurrent, on a gentle setting. And in a previous discussion with scientist and skincare founder Bev May Sanderson, we talked about how there's a balance between using red light enough to enjoy the benefits versus overdoing it and potentially doing more harm than good. As the owner of Maysama Skincare, Bev has done a lot of research into red light and other types of anti-aging technologies and has launched some of her own devices as well as skincare products that support skin health and work in harmony with red light. Well, you can find out more about Bev and the Maysama range in the video description below. But for today, I've invited her back onto the channel to talk about red light in particular and how we can get the most out of using it in terms of how long we use it, in what form, and what we do and don't use on our skin beforehand. Bev, thank you for joining me again. Oh, thank you for having me back. It's lovely. Well, after our last conversation, you know, we were talking about free radicals and striking a balance with red light use between a helpful release of free radicals and an and overload, trying to avoid too many. And there were just so many questions from that around the do's and don'ts of using red light in general and how to get the best of it. So I thought it would be a good idea to get you back and we can talk some of them through. A great place to start because I'm always asked whenever we're talking about red light therapy, people will say, well, what are you talking about here? And um, in my mind, it's a blend of red and near infrared light. Can you explain um, briefly the difference? Yeah. Red light therapy, I mean, yes, typically it is a blend of red and near infrared, but it can be one or the other. So it, it doesn't have to be really it just depends on the research studies some research studies might be just one or the other and some devices might be one or the other but most of them do combine both because you generally get better results when you combine both so if we look at it you know red is part of the visible light spectrum so we're talking 600 to 780 nanometers Mm -hmm. And then near infrared is 780 nanometers up to 1400 nanometers. So the longer the wavelength, the deeper the penetration into the skin. And that's why it's beneficial to put the two together, because you do really, they, they have a different impact on, I talk most about skin re rejuvenation, because of course, that's the area that I'm interested in. And they certainly have a different impact on skin rejuvenation. Mm. So red works, you know, closer to the surface. So it's very good for brightening, reducing melanin. There's a study around, you know, showing that 613 nanometer wavelengths reduces the amount of melanin in the skin and increases skin brightening. And then in the same study, they looked at 830 nanometers, which is near infrared light. And that increased skin elasticity. So they have this different impact and we saw this also in a, another study, um, which I looked at from a university in Florence, um, mm -hmm. in Italy, where they looked at, this was more sort of in vitro study where they're looking at the, the cells, the impact of red light, you know, on the fibroblasts and, and how they proliferate and, and their action. And they found that the red light helps the fibroblasts to proliferate, to grow and reproduce. Okay. And the near infrared light then helps those fibroblasts mature into myofibroblasts, which are the mature version of a fibroblast cell. And they secrete, well, they synthesize and secrete collagen. So, you know, putting the two together is clearly going to be advantageous for skin rejuvenation. And that's, you know, that's what they found, that not only it's an additive effect, but it's a synergistic effect. 
I mean, most of the masks that are available now, the, the better known brands, they incorporate both, don't they? The red light and the near infrared. And that's probably something people should look out for. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything in particular in a spec, like when you're choosing a red light mask, is there anything you look out for in particular? Well, I do think that the red and near infrared combination is pretty critical for mm -hmm. the skin rejuvenation. I think the only exception to the rule there would be, you know, ladies of colour, they they can sometimes be sensitive to um, near infrared light. Okay. Not generally with a mask, but maybe with a, a panel that would be higher irradiance and you might get some thermal energy. I think that's where potentially they're getting possible pigmentation issues. Now, okay. if you're only concerned with pigmentation and you want the skin rejuvenation, then we would just use the red light. So, okay. you know, you could just select red light and avoid the near infrared light if you were very, very sensitive to pigmentation. I think that's, you know, that's one advantage, understanding that the red and the near infrared have different functions yeah. in that regard. Again, looking at spec, its irradiance is important. So when I'm talking about irradiance, I'm talking about power density. So you'll notice we're talking about the, you know, the leading mask manufacturers like Current Body and, and Omnilux. So the Current Body mask, for example, is 28 milliwatts per centimetre squared. That's the mm. radiance that they quote. And that's that's a good level. Yeah. You know, you'll have um, mitre red panels if you go up to panel. They're about 200 milliwatts per centimetre squared. That's the radiance they're looking at. But that's at zero inches. You're not literally going to be sat there with a panel right in front of your face. You're going to be using it probably you know, 9 yeah. to 12 inches away. So you want to have a minimum biostimulatory level. Of course, all the equipment out there is is based on that, that it is going to have a biostimulatory, it's going to have this biostimulatory level that's going to give you an effect. Other than that, I think it's just down to, you know, horses for courses. What do you prefer? Do you prefer a mask? Do you prefer a panel? Which are you more likely to use? You know, for me, I've used the panel more than the mask. Um, I think that's it comes down to just for me being in a in a routine of using a panel in the morning and then the mask, I tend to use it as a, not necessarily a top up, but you know, if I've missed a treatment or if I'm away for the weekend. So, you know, it's lifestyle choices then, isn't it? You know, what's gonna fit with your lifestyle? Well, after we last um, talked and you mentioned the eye mask from Current Body. Well, I got that and it's great because, you know, when I'm doing my workout in the morning yeah. um, on my little elliptical, machine I, I just wear the eye mask for a couple of minutes when I'm on there it's a really really good point Claire because um I've been using my panel in the morning and I am using that with goggles mm -hmm. because the light is brighter and for other reasons we'll come on to but um I have um, a blocked tear duct at the moment in my eye no. So you can see it's quite red around here. My whole um, lower eye had swollen up recently because of the same thing. Horrible. Painful. Well, I've had this for, for six months and I use the current body eye mask mm. at night to treat this area. So I'm doing like a hot compress over my eyes and then I put my mm. current body mask on because it's just a three minute treatment. And I do believe that, you know, if I miss that, <laughs> mm -hmm. it can have an impact. And it doesn't matter whether you've got your eyes open or shut. I should just mention that because, you know, you're still getting penetration of the light. I do feel that that helps control this. So it gets noticeably worse if I don't do these. Because when I got, I got two in a row recently and um, I was worried that it was the red light triggering it. When I saw my ophthalmologist, he, he was explaining it was dry eyes, basically, due to age. Yes. Isn't it always? So he was also <laughs> suggesting taking omega-3 capsules for that, which I kind of was on and off, but now I'm going for that every single day. Yeah, fish oil every single day, uh, which helps with the dry eyes. I wanted to come back to what was really interesting, where you were talking about that kind of optimal period of time when we should use red light, because, you know, some people use it 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and you were saying that there is a balance um, between uh, getting the benefit out of it and then it tipping into being less beneficial when we're using it over time. And you suggested six minutes um, of treatment. What was that based on? And, and is that a kind of like hard fact or is that just around where you think, you know, based on what the research you've seen, you can get the benefits? Well, just to kind of 
recap on our discussion last time. Um, you know, I use the mask and I use the panel. So if I use the mask, I am doing the full 10 minute treatment. That's what's mm -hmm. recommended by current body. And I'm quite happy with that. If I'm using the panel, then that's where I have reduced my treatment time. That was more really to fit in with my lifestyle. I, I didn't want to be standing there for 10 minutes in the morning. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that within that six minutes, I've received sufficient benefit. And, you know, we, we talked a bit about the biphasic dose response last time as well. And, you know, if you listen to leading photobiomodulation scientist, Dr. Hamblin, he talks about the, the biphasic dose response. He's referred Let's to- remind us what that was, biphasic. What does that mean? Biphasic dose response is basically a curve, which basically sort of goes like this up and then down, which shows that when you get the stimulus, you initially, um, you get a bit of the stimulus and you get a little bit of the response, more of the stimulus, more response, and then it reaches a point where more of the stimulus doesn't give you any more response and actually you continue and then you get less and less the response and eventually it drops below the line where it becomes inhibitory. So this is what we refer to as the Arndt Schultz rule or the biphasic dose response. And it just exists in biological systems. You know, I know viewers want to kind of pinpoint what is the optimal, but it's there's lots and lots of variables, you know, mm. concerned. We're talking about, you know, what's the what wavelengths are being used, what's the irradiance um, that we're using. So you know, what milliwatts per centimeter squared, that's your radiance, it's the power density, and what's the time, because all those things make up the dose. And, and then with biological systems, you've got more variance as well, because results differ from person to person. If you look at in vitro studies, mm -hmm. it's easier to control that environment. In vitro studies are when you're just working with cells effectively in a Petri dish. And then you've got small animal studies. Again, you're kind of going up a level and it's harder to control, but a little bit easier to control. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into humans, <laughs> you know, there's so many variables. Scientists and researchers are getting closer to what they believe is a sort of optimal window, if you like. And they're starting to talk about um, a power density of two to 10 joules per centimeter squared. So there's a couple of studies we can we can reference, I think, which would give people confidence about the, the biphasic dose response. So there was one with fibroblasts where they're just looking at different levels of affluence. And it was the low and the moderate that helped the fibroblasts to proliferate and improve wound healing. And the, the high intensities just were found not to be effective. And then bang up to date, there's one in 2003, which is looking at um, ulcers in in rats mm -hmm. and um that one again they used low fluence like four six and eight joules per centimeter squared and that was effective but as soon as they upped that to 15 it wasn't seen to be effective so you know you can see that there clearly is this kind of trigger point this cutoff you know i i have spoken to some people that say oh you know i will do half an hour in front of my panel and i'm thinking i wouldn't do that <laughs> yeah because clearly there is a point where you get diminishing returns mm -hmm. and eventually there is a point where it becomes a negative effect and in yeah. entry and that's what we're just trying to avoid but I can't say to you Claire that you know six minutes is that trigger point it's it's not you know it's yeah. just that was my choice of time to um, fit in with my schedule and confident that I was receiving enough of a dose to be beneficial. I was reluctant about using red light because I could totally understand that there has to be a tipping point with it. With anything in life, you can have too much of it. I just couldn't work out what that was. And to understand that within a short period of time, I could still get the benefits. And particularly when you're using it every day, um, you just want to be a little bit more cautious about how long you're using it for. So I, I follow yeah. the six minute rule now with, with the mask as well. And yeah, why not? I've noticed skin changes. It must be a few months now that I've been using it almost daily. It looks amazing. Well, I, I see a difference in my, you know, 50 year old skin. And I'm talking really about very stubborn lines on my forehead that recently I've thought, these are shifting a little bit. They're just lightening a little bit. Yes, um, and, and bounce, skin elasticity yeah. in, in general. 
yeah I would say I would definitely say and I and I credit the red light with a lot of that so it's um it's been a good good thing for me anyway not to say those higher wavelengths are not valuable for different applications but because for pain relief you want those higher um power mm. densities that's when they're important you know for pain relief for muscle recovery it's very different to treating skin for rejuvenation mm -hmm. i i often like to think well what is the minimum amount if i can use this device um what is the minimum amount of time i can use it for or the minimum frequency i can use it for and see results and you can build up yourself yeah these are the rules of pharmacology they never talk about maximum dose no. they always talk about minimum dose and it's the minimum dose you want to mm. get a biostimulatory effect. Obviously, we want to optimize things, mm. but it's not about maximums. Mm. It's about minimum doses and optimal treatment. I also wanted to ask around, you know, the don'ts of using red light, if there is such a thing, because um, I've had a few people ask about whether they can use oil-based serums. So if there's oil in the serum, a little like with microcurrent, we're told not to use oil because it can you know, affect the current flow. Is that the same for red light? Oils in general can reduce light penetration. There are exceptions to that rule because we can get very complex here. It actually d depends on the refractive index of the oil, but you're never gonna know what that is. So, you know, um, I would possibly uh, read into that that, um, you know, some oils that are most similar to skin, like jojoba oil, for example, mm -hmm. are likely to have a refractive index, which is similar um, and therefore would benefit. But that's never, ever been tested. So in general, water based serums or gel based serums are better than oil based, -based serums um, when you're using a red light. You certainly would want to avoid emollients. So you don't want to be putting moisturizers on. Yeah. You don't want to be using SPF and then putting your light on or facial oil, those things. Is there oil in the serum? In my serum? Yeah. In my serum, the oil content is less than 1%, so it's actually negligible. It's um, it's a gel-based serum. Right, okay. It's actually formulated in a base of pure aloe vera gel, so it actually helps with light penetration. Now, you talked about pulsed red light last time, which was interesting, and you were suggesting that if somebody was sitting in front of a red light panel, you could try turning your head from side to side uh, to get a kind of pulse light effect. What is it that you like about pulse light? Why is it beneficial? I absolutely love pulse light. I mean, our whole um, proposition behind Maysama's LED beauty devices that are evolving now is, is around pulse light. And this all came from a discussion with Andre Summer. Mm -hmm. um, so Maysama has an ongoing dialogue with various photobiomodulation scientists, Andre Summer, Dr. Hamlin and our own scientists in you know, a research team over at the Nelson Mandela Institute in South Africa. Andre Summer, you may recall, wrote the original paper, which was around uh, green tea and red light, a powerful duo for skin rejuvenation. And that kicked off the whole thing, didn't it, about green tea and, and red light. So in conversation with, with Andre Summer, he was explaining that they've been using pulse light for many years in their studies. And they're doing studies around cancer drugs. So they've been using 670 nanometer, so that's red light, um, red light in a pulsed mode to help with the uptake of cancer drugs. And he explained to me that pulse light literally helps the drug um, uptake by the cell. And I'll explain why. So LED light really has two main physiological impacts on the cell. It increases the volume of the cytosol, so that's the fluid inside the cell, mm -hmm. and it increases the viscosity of the interfacial water layers. And when you shine the red light on the cell, the cell literally just swells up. And then when you turn the light off, the cell contracts. So pulsing has this effect where the cell breathes. And that effect, Summer's team refer to as transmembrane convection. When it contracts, then the cell literally sucks in any nanoparticles around it into the cell. So it's transmembrane convection or a cell light pump mechanism, they also refer to it as. One of those drugs is EGCG, which 
Epigallo Catechin Gallate, you might know it better as the flavonoid from green tea. So that is a, you know, it has an effect on, on treating cancer. So they've been using EGCG in their studies and showing how pulse red light improves the uptake of this as a cancer drug. So it was Summer that suggested to May Summer, you know, used pulsed light. And so from that, you know, our kind of advance of LED beauty devices, uh, you know, starting with our Bindstone massager and then our Mesama urchin and now the LED hair growth comb and coming very, very soon, our own oh LED my goodness. towel. You have been busy. I have been busy. I've been a busy, busy girl. So that will be launched sometime in September, just waiting okay. for it to hit the So I think viewers at home, because I'm sitting here thinking this, what does that mean? Um, so I've got a red light mask. I've got the little eye mask. You know, I'm interested in using a panel, but should I be using pulse light instead? I mean, what is, for the average consumer, what benefit is there for them with pulse light? Well, it's going to be in relation to absorption of skincare firstly. You know, that's okay. that's really why we're doing it. It's tying it in with your skincare regime. So I'm only really interested in targeted treatments for skin rejuvenation. If the consumer has LED equipment already, it's it's already working. You don't necessarily need to go out and buy another one. You know, you don't need to do that. You're already getting a benefit from those devices. What I'm interested in is optimizing protocols and as everybody is you know you, you look at what's happening with current body they're now talking about you know if you, you might notice in their lip perfector and their eye mask they're not just using one wavelength of red light and near infrared they started to use more than one wavelength you know those are my i've mask. used that lip perfector just i, I used yeah. it for six weeks just as a little experiment and it did plump my lips that was what was kind of switched me on to red light in the first place. I thought, hmm, exactly. something's happened here. But, you know, we're talking about marginal gains now, really, aren't we? Mm. You know, so we, we've worked out the basis of what works. But how do we make it better? How do mm. we make it better? And pulse light, I strongly believe, you know, and the evidence supports that it is better. There, there are numerous studies, not just Sommer's research, but there are numerous studies around pulse light and pretty much across the board, there are exceptions to the rule as there always are in research, but pretty much across the board, you get a better outcome with pulse light. From my own experience, I'm moving towards using pulse light. You know, the, the evidence I find very, very compelling. Um, and it's the journey that I'm on. I have the little urchin here, which I've been um, using for the last few days. And what I like about it is that used on that lower strength it's really very gentle isn't it so you can I don't like where you can feel I know that the urchin incorporates um microcurrent pulse red light sonic vibration as well yeah and I liked that it, you you know you weren't feeling like your skin was zapped that's some, something that I've experienced with other microcurrent de devices where it's really quite uncomfortable and so you're less likely to use it long term if there's discomfort involved. I mean, this is electrotherapy combined with red light. When you, Obviously, it's a cleanser as well. You know, you can use the, the cleansing option first and then take that off and then you're onto the red light. So at the lowest level, it performs more like microcurrent. You mm -hmm. barely feel it on your skin. And on a higher level, more like EMS that grabs the muscle and it will grab the muscle for about six seconds and then it releases it. Wow. And in grabbing it and releasing it, you're training that muscle to where you want it to be. An EMS would be equivalent to something like a TENS machine, which I used in childbirth. I'll never forget that because as soon as the labor was over, I realized I had this high intensity EMS. <laughs> and I was like being electrocuted in my, in my yeah, birthing yeah. chair. Yeah, <laughs> I never went that way. But, you know, again, electrotherapy is, is not clear defined where there's a cutoff between microcurrent and electrical muscle stimulation or EMS, there isn't. This, the maximum amperage of this device is 400 microamps. So that's mm. in line with a new face, you know, um, that in theory would be a microcurrent device. Mm -hmm. But then you've also got the voltage that you switch. When you're switching up the voltage, you increase the way that it's perceived on the skin. So if anyone has a concern over EMS depleting ATP, you might be talking about your TENS machines and you might be talking about the experiments, you know, where they're using high amperage, 
but not at 400 microamps. At mm -hmm. 400 microamps, you still increase ATP. So I just yeah. want to set the record straight on that one. So it's it's a fantastic tool for lifting and firming. Mm -hmm. um, I also, you know, I've got a whole crowd of people who just love it for the cleanser alone. You know, they mm -hmm. love the sonic vibration for the cleanser. And perhaps they're of a younger generation where they're perhaps not into the anti-aging quite so much and they haven't really ventured into microcurrent. But I love combining modalities. Mm -hmm. I want multi-benefit. Mm -hmm. I want time saving. And that's where I'm going with these devices. If I can combine modalities and get the benefits of both, that's you know, it's time saving and I've got the benefit of two or three or four modalities in one device. That suits my lifestyle. One of the big questions uh, we've we've touched on it is about safety of red light around our eyes. And you know, you, you mentioned I think that you wear goggles. Uh, is red light safe for use around our eyes? Do you think? I mean, first of all, it's probably worth noting that there's two different potential types of damage to the eye. There's photochemical and there's thermal damage, and we're far more likely to get photochemical damage from bright sunlight than we are thermal damage from near infrared light. I think where people have got concerned is they, they've heard that uh, near infrared radiation can lead to cataracts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is historical information around um, glass blowers and furnace workers getting cataracts from prolonged exposure to near infrared radiation but you know you have to consider you've got to take everything in context haven't you mm -hmm. you know we're, these workers in particular are exposed to very very high levels on a daily basis for prolonged periods yeah yeah for prolonged periods you know years we're talking about and again you know we talked we touched on pharmacology and all drugs are toxic at very very high levels so you have to take dosing into consideration and the dosing at which we're using red light therapy is well within the beneficial dosing capacity so that's a really really important point and there is a, st a stack a ton of information out there that supports that red light and near infrared light is beneficial to eye health you know, there's lots of papers around macular degen degeneration so just mm -hmm. deterioration of eyesight as we age mm -hmm. which is typically down to a decrease in atp production and then inflammation of the eye that uh, contributes to a decline in vision and red and near infrared light has been proven to be beneficial to decrease the incidence of macular degeneration it's a fantastic study where um, more than 50% of the participants can, um, when they do the visual test, they can then read an additional five to eight lines on the, you know, the visual right. tests uh, compared to 14% with the control group. So that's, that's you know, very significant. And not only was there an improvement in their eyesight, but there was a, a decrease in a distortion of their eyesight and the amount of blood vessels that were accumulating. So highly beneficial and it's down to the fact that red and near infrared light increases the amount of ATP and reduces inflammation so there's a whole wealth of information around macular degeneration and how red and near infrared light can help with that um, there's also other eye conditions like glaucoma where you're getting mm -hmm. an increase in the pressure in the eye and red and near infrared light I think near infrared light in particular has been shown to reduce the incidence of glycoma. It's also been shown to reduce the incidence of eye injury. So another study on, I think this was, was on red light, where they were looking at um, you know, foreign objects in the eye and then just recovery mm -hmm. afterwards. And when they used red light, it, in, it reduced the healing time by 42%. You know, okay. so there's some, some fantastic stats out there. Now, you mentioned that I use goggles with my light. Um, mm -hmm. I do, um, but um, I do and I don't <laughs> because I don't with the current body, uh, current body mask. Which um, has the cutaways, so it's not directly in your eyes, it's yeah. surrounding the eyes, yeah. That's right. I don't with the mask. I don't wear goggles with the mask. Um, I 
did and didn't use red um, goggles with the MITRE red light panel. Um, you know, with the information around it, I'm confident that that red and infrared light is beneficial to eye health. But you have to consider that the panel is a lot brighter. Mm. So for comfort, I may wear, you know, because it depends. If you're in a well-lit room, actually, you don't really experience, you know, the brightness to the same effect. But yeah. If you're doing your treatment at night and it's a dark room, then you suddenly put a red light on it. Like, Ooh. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's pretty intense, isn't it? So goggles can be quite comforting. Now, of course, now, you know, moving on to my my own panel and I'm using pulse light mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. you're going up another level where it's not just about the brightness. You've now got pulsing light and pulsing light is quite distracting. If you imagine you're driving down a road and it's a sunny day and then you go past like a, an avenue of trees mm -hmm. and you get mm -hmm. the sunlight flashing through those trees. Mm -hmm. You kind of got your sunglasses on, haven't you? Because it's a bit distracting. So pulsing light is beneficial but at the same time it's quite distracting mm -hmm. so it's more comforting to wear goggles in that situation and that's why I wear them with my with my panel yeah I think I think probably if I was sitting in front of a bright panel I'd I'd either have my eyes shut or or wearing goggles so I think there's probably still yeah. a little bit of an unknown element around it so it's uh why not why not just wear the goggles and then if in any doubt you know yeah. wear goggles um for me I'm satisfied that it's only beneficial at the yeah. levels that we're using it. But if people have any doubt, wear your goggles. Yeah, exactly. Good to see you, Bev. Thank you. And you. Thanks, Claire. There are huge frustrations around skincare at the moment because so much is available to us, but there's not an abundance of science to support it. And so we try to figure out as users what we think might be most helpful at our age and stage in life and for our own skin type. I don't think if you're following the minimum use approach with devices that you can go too far wrong with the aim being to benefit from frequently using technologies like microcurrent and red light therapy without being concerned about overdoing it and possibly having a negative impact on your skin's health and volume. That's just my approach. As always, I do like to hear your opinions in the comments. What does optimal use of red light look like for you and how does it help you? What kind of results are you achieving? For now, thanks for watching and listening and I'll see you next time.